Okay, so well, I've I've written both SQL and and Mongo queries, <laughs> and when I when I first learned and used Mongo, I was actually very very excited. I was blown away because Mongo it's a great document store. It allows you to store uh, JSON documents like no other database. It's very simple to use. And I realized that finally the, the OR, the object relational mapping war is over with, with MongoDB and with the documents. Moreover, if you take MongoDB and you take the cloud, like Amazon Web Services or anything, then scaling, essentially, scaling a data store has become a commodity. It's very simple. You don't need any money. You can just go there, put up a couple of boxes, set up Mongo. Tengen will help you with that. They have great tutorials. And you're ready to go. You can develop your app. But however, I'm, I'm, I was also confused when I saw it. Because working in more than 15 years in, in industry and academia with, uh, with databases, I was wondering, how the heck do I get information out of Mongo? How the heck can I can I do queries? And I yeah, as I said, I was very confused about that. And um, I was expecting the NoSQL community, or especially Mongo, to come up with uh, with something that that I know that is more more SQL and more what what I was used to to use, what I was familiar with in in from the SQL space. So that's also why. I ask those questions, how many people actually know SQL, how many use Mongo queries? <clears throat> and so this, this, having this in mind and this confusion at 28 milliseconds, which is the company that I, that I work for and the CTO over there, <clears throat> we asked ourselves a couple of questions, actually three questions. So one of them is how do, you, how do you get, how do you write or develop complex queries on top of MongoDB? <laughs> And so do you either start to develop your own boring join group by windowing algorithm, or would you rather use something that has been studied like more than 30 years and rely on an impl implementation on that and use a, use a language that is built for that without having to, to do it yourself? So that was like the first question that, that we had. The second question is, if you, if you have a data store like Mongo, and sometimes you, you store dates, date time stamps, whatever in there, dates with, with time zones. And in your queries, you actually want to do computation. You want to query using that date information. You want to query using durations and everything. And then the question is, do you, in your host language, let's say JavaScript or Python or, or Java, do you actually start getting all the data and doing the query in the host language yourself, caring about how does the time zone work and how do you compute the duration given that time zone, how do you subtract to, to date times, all of that. And, or do you rather want to use a language that has built-in support for date times and that is a high level language that allows you to use those arithmetic operations inside the query language itself. And then the third question that we ask ourselves is, so <clears throat> no, NoSQL is great, and Mongo is the, the fastest growing NoSQL database. There are also other NoSQL data stores, like Couch, Couchbase. And all of them have their own query language. So Mongo has a query language, and Couch is just coming up with a query language for JSON. And so you as a developer, would you rather learn for each data store that you use a, a new query language? Or would you like to use a standardized query language that you as a developer know and you don't care which kind of data store is, is underneath? Of course, you will have to adjust the details and the details of the data store. But wouldn't it be great if there was a standardized high level language that you could use? So these were the three questions that we asked ourselves at 20 milliseconds. And this, those three questions, those were, have been driving our mission since then. So what we did is we developed JSONIC. And JSONIC is a high level query language, a very powerful one, that allows you to query NoSQL data stores the way you're used to from SQL. So that's what we're trying to do. 
And I don't have, I don't want to go any any deeper in slides or anything. So the rest of my thing, if the wireless works, will be a, a demo, and I will be showing you some queries and do it maybe interactive. So if you have any questions, then just ask. I'm sorry if it's <coughs> sure. Um, so is JSONic is is something that you load on top of the driver um, and you can use them in your application? Or is it mostly like a SQL tool to talk to the data? So, <coughs> it's a very good question. So JSONic is actually just an open specification. It's, it's nothing more. It's a piece of paper that specifies a language. And it's, it's open. And at 28 milliseconds, what we do is we implement JSONic and have a sophisticated implementation on top of MongoDB. And so you can use it. It's a service in the cloud. It's a query service. And uh, you, can, you can get to the query results I can show to you using the REST API, essentially. But JSONic, per se, is just an open specification. And I, in this talk, I would rather, so I'm going to give you the demo using our product. But it's really about the focus of the language and not about the product itself. The product is just one implementation, and it's a rather new language, but there are other implementations emerging. IBM has just uh, announced WebSphere, JSONic support in WebSphere. I heard about it in announcements, so I didn't know about it before. <coughs> We're talking with Oracle to put it on their Berkeley DB database. It's called Oracle NoSQL now, not Berkeley DB. Thank you. Does it answer question? Yes. <clears throat> okay. Any more questions? Otherwise, I'll just try to see if the demo works. So let me copy something here. <coughs> so this is this is the platform of 28 milliseconds, and the product is called 28IO. It's in private beta right now. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create a project here, and I call it LA Meetup. And what I will do is I will choose the free plan here. And what I will do is I will just connect this project to a MongoDB database that I have. So in here, there's a connection string to a MongoDB database. It's hosted on MongoHQ. The database name is Stock, Stack Overflow. The user is Christy. And there's also a password. I will check if I right. And create the project. <clears throat> so now what I can do here is I can, first of all, the, the, the MongoDB database, what it has, it has four collections in here, and we automatically show them. And in this, in this demo, I will only focus on two collections. And the collections contain data from Stack Overflow, a subset of the Stack Overflow data set, everything, the questions and answers regarding uh, that contain the tag NoSQL. And so <clears throat> the data looks looks like this. The answers have a question ID to the question that they refer to, a last activity date, and the score. And each <clears throat> each answer in here is a nested object that has uh, denormalized the information of the owner of that of that answer. So here, the display name of the of the guy asking or giving the answer to the question is uh, Niels van der Rist. He's registered and he has a reputation, stuff like this. So pretty basic JSON document. And similarly, the FAQ collection, which obviously has the, the question ID, and then a title, tags. Also, they replicate some, some owner information here, how often the question has been viewed, stuff like that. All of the stuff that you would imagine to be in a database that is behind the Stack Overflow. And so having those two, two collections, if you, if you know SQL, there are a bunch of things that you, that you want to ask those two collections. And so I'm going to show you JSONic and uh, ask, uh, show you essentially a bunch of queries, what you can do with the language. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm just typing a, a query now. And what I want to know is I want to get out of the FAQ collection all of the questions that have an answer. So what I'm going to do is I say for each question in the collection FAQ, where the question 
field is answered exists or is true, I'm going to return a new JSON object that contains the title of the question. And then I can run it, and you can see the results here. So there are a couple of things that are maybe important to understand here. <coughs> First of all, I, somehow I like it. Everybody who is a developer and who looks at the query can probably try to figure out, uh, figure out what the result of the query is or what the purpose of the query is. The second thing to, to understand from this query is whenever we show JSONic, people usually ask, why don't you use SQL? Why don't you just use SQL? That's what everybody knows. And the answer to this is that the JSONic language has been specifically designed for JSON support. And one thing that you can see here is that the language has a construct that allows you to create new JSON objects, okay? And so with SQL, because there's no JSON support in SQL, you cannot do that. And constructs, constructing objects is uh, very useful for a lot of stuff. For example, here, we don't want to expose the entire uh, FAQ content. We just want to expose the title. So that's, that's why this stuff here is pretty helpful. And so let me work out the query a little bit more. So what I can do also is that you're probably used to I can just order the result, and let's say we want to order it by the last edit date in descending order, and also maybe get the, the last edited date here. So I can do this, and now what it will do is it will sort according to the last edit date. But as you can see in the result, that's somehow strange. In Mongo, Null always, the value null or non-existent in this case, always compares less than any other atomic value. And that's why if I, actually in this case it's, it's, it's bigger um, because it's empty, but that's not very helpful, the null here. And actually I would have expected the nulls to be at the end. So what I can do here is I can show you that the language, JSONic itself, is fully composable, which means wherever you can have a value, you can also have an expression. So what I can do here is I can actually go in the order by clause and do an if the last edit date exists, then I would like to return the last edit date. And otherwise, I would like to put it at the end, so I return the possible, the smallest possible value here, which is null. It will definitely be smaller than in the other one, and still have it in descending order. So now you, what you will see is that all the null values are actually at the end of the query result. I will have to scroll pretty far, so you have to, you have to trust me. So that's a couple of interesting ob observations. First of all, it's a query that is <coughs> relatively sophisticated. It does some construction. It does some filtering. It um, does some, some order by, and it has a special condition in the order by. But I guess everybody can understand what it means, and it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Could you uh, dig a little bit deeper into, in this particular case, what work is being done on the database side and what work is being done on the client side? Very good question. So, <clears throat> JSONic is a, is a specification, okay? Mm -hmm. They just specify, it's a declarative language, and what the specification specifies is what the result of this query will be. It doesn't tell you anything about the optimization. The optimization is entirely left to the implementation. And like in SQL, uh, it's up to the implementation and to the database optimizer what to do with this. So that's just one thing to, to mention here. So our implementation does a couple of sophisticated things in Mongo. So essentially what we do is for the collection function, we use uh, the database driver, the C++ database driver, and get all the, all the objects to the client side. Now, this will not be very efficient for several reasons. First of all, you transfer a lot of data, whereas from the query, you can see that you actually only need three values. You only need the is answered, the title, and the last edit date. So what we do is we figure this out, and we tell Mongo, just give us those three values, something that is called document projection. On the other hand, what we do is, <coughs> if 
your MongoDB database has an index on the is answered field, then we will know about this index and push down the query and leverage all of Mongo's query capabilities to only get already the subset of the is answered queries over. And um, if, the, uh, if there was an index on the last edit date, a range index in the B tree, then we would also remove the order by and uh, especially uh, do the query and get the results already sorted. But in this case, with the if, it's not possible, but if it was the, the plain order by that we would do this. Does that make sense? Yes, so can you see, can you like translate to that the equivalent of Mongo query? The equivalent Mongo query <coughs> would be... So it's not automatic. Hmm? So it would be, depending I mean, on I mean, from... I mean, I mean, I guess my question is more of like, can, can you automatically provide like the equivalent Mongo query? Not like <coughs> what it would look like in Mongo. So what you can do is you can do get the collection, you can filter it obviously, you can uh, project with another argument, not within a single query. You can project. Uh, you can order by, but with a, with a special condition, I think it would already be pretty hard. You would have to, to maybe filter and nulls out or do something special about it. So most of the stuff, 90% 90 per, 90 you, you can do with a Mongo query, but the, the rest here you I heard that in MongoDB you can't uh, do join statements. Would this uh, extension allow you to do jo join statements? Yes, it will. <coughs> so I'm going to show you some more examples for this one that will demonstrate. So that's the first basic question, basic query. <coughs> so then, let's just delete that. The next query that I would like to ask is uh, how many answers are there per user? So how many answers does a speci uh, specific user give? <coughs> so for this, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to do for answer, but this time in the collection answers. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a group by clause that says group by name, where the name is in the owner field of the JSON document, the display name. So I'm going to group all entries in the collection answers by the owner's display name. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a new variable, which is called count. And what I bind to this variable is the count of the set of answers within each group. So for each group, which is a user, I count his number of answers. And then I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to do order by the count descending, and I'm going to write another projection here, which is uh, I'm going to give the user, I'll call it name, and count. So that's another popular SQL query that you usually do with a, with a group by statement and some order by and some some aggregation that you usually in SQL have in the having clause. So if I run this, what it will give me is, it will give me the users in the database with the number of answers that they have. So <coughs> it's only nine lines of code that does a pretty powerful query that does grouping aggre and aggregation. Yes, please. Uh, is the query order independent? Is the count always going to be for the group's answers, regardless whether or not it comes before or after the group by clause? Uh, no, it's not. So in this case, uh, the count is after the group by clause, so it counts the answer. Before the group by clause, there would be only one answer here, because that's what the, what the for clause does. Mm -hmm. But after the group by clause, the answer is actually a tuple that contains uh, multiples, such that you can count. It's like having in SQL. Mm -hmm. So you could ask the same question, like how much of that can you do in Mongo? And <clears throat> the truth is, since version, I guess it's 2.0 or 2.2, Mongo announced something that is called that they call the aggregation framework. It allows you to do exactly that query. It allows you to do grouping. They have some, some aggregation functions, in which case I use, I use count here, and they can do the order. And they can do the, the projection and the, the construction. 
<coughs> now, the difference here is, uh, first of all, I find this query a lot easier to read and write. And if I look at it next time, I will probably remember what I wanted to do with this query. Mongo also has a couple of limitations. For example, the result set cannot be more than 60 megabytes because that's the maximum size of a MongoDB JSON document or a BSON document. But I wouldn't say it's a restriction from them. I think it's they are doing it for a reason because they want to keep the number of parallel queries in their system uh, reasonable and want to exploit all the memories, all the memory. And they they also tell you that if you use aggregation framework queries, that you should usually cache the results. Because otherwise, you're just flooding your data store with very computational intensive queries. And that makes sense. Now, 28.io on top of MongoDB is separating the query service from the database. And this is possible in NoSQL because you usually don't want all those transaction semantics. So the advantage here would be that you can do the computation and scale it completely independently of your data store without having to do like complex computations in your data store and slow down the, the inserts or the or other query operations in Mongo. Yes, please. But it's not really scaling independently because you have to stream all the data to the client, right? That's true. But the queries are much simpler, much less main memory intensive because the queries that we do entirely stream in Mongo. And it's very easy to scale those queries with uh, with Mongo. You would just add more replica sets to it, more members of a replica set, and uh, read from the slaves. And then the the queries are much simpler. So if you but have lots of those queries, I'm sorry, please go ahead. So if you have lots of those queries, then it's probably worth it to separate it because the the queries that we do to Mongo are much much simpler. But the throughput on the client is still your bottleneck, right? You're, you're doing the computation in one place. We, yeah, but uh, we can we can scale the the query processing completely in independently. So if our service is hosted on Amazon, so if there are more queries, we will just bring up more boxes, and each of the the boxes will then run their own queries. So you can you can scale it as, as, as much uh, as I'm, you want. Yeah, I think this is kind of related to the question. So can you kind of like uh, give a little high level overview of like the architecture? So you have mm -hmm. non DB. You, are you saying you have a query service on top of that yes. that does the aggregation, and then you have a client, um, which is this, that talks to this yes. kind of like aggregation layer? Yes. Okay. So I guess I'm just trying to, to like get the process here and uh, sort of concrete in my mind. Sure. You have a bunch of collections. You're grouping them by the name, yes. and then you're counting them. Yes. Is every single record passing through a single process? Are subsets of the data passing through different processes, and then is there some sort of aggregation mm -hmm. on top of that intermediate result? That's a very good question. So, <clears throat> in the, the simple and the free version, it's passing through one process on our side, which means it's bound to, to one box. But in the dedicated service, what we do is um, we parallelize those queries across the query ser servers. So, there are two ways of parallelizing queries here. One is the inter-query parallelization. If you have many queries, you just scale out your, your query servers. If you have computational expensive queries, like the group by, then you can uh, do intra-query parallelization and do the computation of one query on several machines. But it's it's completely, we, maybe we can take more of the implementation step offline, because the, the main purpose of this is not to advertise our product, but to, to show you the language. And in terms of the language, it's a declarative language. And again, optimizing a declarative language and how you execute it is completely left to the implementation. This one just describes you the how the query looks like, and it tells you what the result is. It's a formal specification. Make sense? OK, so that's the purpose here. Now, the next query that I want to show you, and it's a little bit an extension of this one, is I want to get the reputation for for each of the users, the, the average reputation that, that those guys have. So what I will do is I will keep the group by, I will group by the user, and I will introduce another variable which says average rep, uh, reputation. 
And what I will do is I will do the average over the set of answers and then owner reputation. So there's another aggregation function, it does average here. And what I can do here is I can just chain several functions, it's a functional language, and show you that there are plenty of more plenty more functions in the language that allow you to do useful stuff. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to return this one. what you see is that this guy has the highest reputation. No, it does, actually doesn't because I didn't put the order by. Descending, and what I will do is I will say here that objects that don't, or users that don't have a reputation, they will be at the end. So I can say descending and put empty list. It's another keyword. <coughs> Support. And so now the biggest guy is at the top. So that's pretty much the same concept of the creed and the creed that we that we saw before. <coughs> but it shows you there there are a lot of arithmetic and mathematical functions in the language that you can use. Whereas in in, in Mongo, some some of those functions are available, but some are not. And so the set of functions in the language is pretty comprehensive. But since this query is a little similar to the further one, I want to introduce another concept here. I want to introduce the, the concept of nested queries. So I said the language is fully compositional. And what I can do now is, let's say, I want to get for each user and the reputation also his three highest scored queries, uh, questions. Sorry. So what I can do here is I can write another query in the value of this JSON document, which says, for each answer in, in this case, the set of answers here, and it's a set because I grouped. I want to order by dollar a score descending, and return just in this case the question. And because so those will give this will give me all of the answers of the user in descending order by the score. But I said I want to have only the three topmost ones. So what I can do is I can use the subsequence function here and say, give me only one, two, three. So now what you can see is <coughs> that there are three objects, three values coming out of that nested query. And JSONIC implicitly creates an array here and puts it into the value of the questions. So what you will have is you will have all the questions ID, IDs for each user and the reputation. So 11 lines of code, and we are starting to do some really powerful stuff here. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. yes. How significant are, are tabs and carriage returns? Can you put this all on a single line? And yeah. Not significant at all. <coughs> Unless I create a string, then they become significant and I can put the uh, carriage return in the string. And a string, so I could just put a string literal everywhere. everywhere. So I can just have fixed values. And then I could do something else. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. So dollar sign A is at and do answer A, dollar sign answer and dollar sign name, all of the variables with dollar signs you just created in that query. It's not something that's No, made those are just variable name. names that I make up. Okay. So whenever I have a for group by a let, I'm introducing a new variable, defining a new variable. And to answer your questions with the joins, so yes, the language can do joins. You can do queries on more than one collection, an arbitrary number of collections. And what I could do here in the subquery is I could write a nested query that goes to the FAQs collection and actually, instead of the question ID, give me the title of each of the questions. So I can join two collections. And especially the join and the group by, I think, are a pretty significant contribution because right now, what, what NoSQL developers do 
and that's why we, we say the pressure is actually on you developers now with MongoDB. You in Python or or uh, Node.js or in Java, you have to get the contents from to uh, from two collections, and for each query that you want to have, you have to implement your own join algorithm. So you're starting to figure out what kind of join algorithm should I use? Should I rely on the sorting? Should I use a hash based uh, join algorithm? Whatever. So you're you're reinventing the wheel, I think. Whereas if you have a high level language and you have somebody that implements it for you, and this somebody looks at some research that has been done in the last 30 years, then they will, the implementation will probably be much better than yours, in the average case. Of course, if you have a, a highly specific use case, you can always do something, something more efficient. <coughs> in general, I would assume that uh, an implementation in such a language and an optimizer choosing the implementation would be much better. Yes? So these complex queries, were they, were you originally not able to do them in MongoDB or would it have been more complicated, less efficient to do them in MongoDB as opposed so to this way? The answer is not yes or no. So simple queries, what I consider simple queries, you can do in Mongo, definitely. Mongo also, with every release, they come up with new that features of their query language that makes it more powerful. As I said, in version 2.0 or 2.2, I don't know, they introduced the aggregation framework that finally allowed you to do a group by. JSONIC on the other side comes comes from the other end. It's a complete Turing, compl uh, a Turing complete functional language. It's You can do everything that you want in it. And um, there is a lot of stuff that you cannot do with Mongo that the developer would have to do in the host language himself. Okay. And that's what develop NoSQL developers are doing those things. And uh, if you have SQL experience, it'll definitely cross over to JSON. I can't answer the question. That's <laughs> something that, that you guys need to, need to tell me, whether because you all said you have more SQL than Mongo experience. Mm -hmm. Well, if, for those of you that have experience with both, you need to tell, tell me what do you think? Maybe we can leave that for a discussion a little bit later. Yes. <coughs> and, and if this question shouldn't be answered here, that's fine. Um, so in, in the case that you were wanted to do the join and get these titles out of the uh, FAQ, would you be getting all the IDs and doing some sort of sort or would you be sending individual queries to the other collection? <coughs> so again, it's an, it's an optimization question. <coughs> so I can tell you what our product does in this case, right. or what most probably That's why I ask, I, I, if you don't want to answer that it's your product, no, no, we, we, can do, we can do that. So <coughs> if, you're, if you don't have any indexes on your FAQ collection, especially on the question field, then what we will do is, it will probably be, we will bring both of the collections in memory. So you actually look at that? We do look at that, yes. So, but if there's no index, we bring one side into a hash table with the question IDs, and then we would run over the, the, the other side and probe the hash table, which right. is called a, a hash-based join in this case. Now, if you do have an index on the question ID, then the optimizer in this case will recognize it, and for each question ID, it will probe the index, the model uh, index. That makes sense. Do you, do you look at the index every single time, or do you maintain that state in some sort of, uh, Oh, um, <coughs> so, so what I mean, we Once do, you know there's an index, you don't look it up every single time, right? You mean you look up that there is an index? Yes. Um, so what we allow you in the, in the product to do is we al when you connect first, we suck all the indexes in. Ah. You can have a button that allows you to refresh the indexes. Yeah, and sense. the queries are pre-compiled. So <coughs> the, the query actually isn't compiled all the time, only if you make some changes in order to avoid the whole optimization process going on every time. Thank you. Makes good sense. Yes, please. So in, when building queries programmatically, um, is string concatenation sort of the order of the day? Is there a 
like data the representation of the query that you can use to compose like pieces together? I'm not sure I... So with it's SQL, when you're trying to create a complex query where you have some aspect of it which is like programmatically, I understand these things are recompiled, but I'm okay. just kind of trying to, to think so, of, so the idea here is that these queries are never, uh, don't, they're not parameterized anyway. So there are several ways to do it. You can either do your query here, develop it in this, this browser-based thing, store it, and call it using the REST API. You can also send a query from your client doing string concatenation, send it to us. In this case, we will compile it, or you can store it. We will com store the compiled plan, you can get the result. Now, what you can also do is you in the queries, you can access the entire HTTP context of the request that was made to trigger the query, in which case you can using HTTP in your query parameter, send some parameters that you bind in here. So the query will still be pre-compiled, but the values you will fill in at runtime. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. I have one more question. Yes. Yeah. Um, so the average and floor, are those a predefined? Can you define your own function? Absolutely. <clears throat> so every expression that you have, you can just wrap in a function declaration and then call it yourself. Those are called user-defined module, uh, user-defined functions. And even more, you can structure or group your user-defined functions in modules and then ship those modules to somebody else. So can you do something like uh, have a function that returns like a JSON and like embed that somewhere else? Sure. So what? It. So what we can do here is we can say declare function local is a namespace in my main query here and it's called construct. It takes two parameters, one is the name and the other one is the average representation. And in the body of the function what I do is I, I construct a new object that has the name and the reputation and now what I can do here in the return clause is I can just invoke this function with the parameters and so I will not do the entire thing I will delete this now but what you can see is that I can <coughs> so you get the same result here and you have factorized stuff into into a function. And you can take any expression and put it in there. It's a functional language. A set of values goes in, sequences of values. Sequences of values come out, and values can be JSON objects. And the functions can be recursive, and the query optimizer will do the best it can do to uh, efficiently execute your query. Yes, please. Um, is the language uh, like query only, or does it do updates, deletes, um, <coughs> very good inserts? Question. So the language does a lot of stuff. It does updates. It specifies declarative updates, which is something that you compute your update and you apply it at the end of the query. Um, in this product, we don't do updates. We implement it. But what we don't want at this point is that customers bring their MongoDB database, connect our service to it, and they are afraid we mess their data up. And that's why we don't allow to use them. We don't allow them to use the updates. But with all of that implemented, you can rename values in a JSON object. You can insert in an object. You can insert in an array. You can replace the value. You can delete from an object or an array, uh, giving the name, the name of the field or the position in the array. And all of that is declared. The language has a, a couple of more extensions. One is a full text extension that allows you to do pretty sophisticated full text queries. And um, with tokenization, scoring, stemming, thesaurus, all of the stuff that you would expect in, a, in an enterprise ready language. Can you use this language? Uh on, say, the client end for a commercial website? 
to um, transfer, to collect data from, say, a web form and transfer it to a Mongo database? <coughs> so, absolutely. The, we have a couple of extension functions, like we developed our own modules and functions that are implemented in C++. And one of those modules is called the HTTP client. And in this HTTP client, what you can do is you can make HTTP calls to the outside world from your query. You can retrieve the result. The result, the content type will tell you whether the result is HTML or JSON or whatever. In case it's JSON, you read it as a string, you parse it, and you can directly work with the, 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 JSON, the JSON document that you get back. So if you, for example, if you don't have a MongoDB database, or no database at all, you could still use the language to do uh, pretty sophisticated ma mashups, for example, and write your entire mashup in just that language. Even without, do you still need a server? Well, you need something that runs the platform or the query processor. Okay. So you can use our query servers to do that. And I can show you offline a couple of such cool queries that you can do what you call web, web services. With calling web services, it's a little, little tricky in a query language, because usually if you have a query language, a declarative one, it's a closed system, and you don't expect the state to change when you optimize. In When you make calls to the outside world, then the query optimizer cannot rely on anything anymore, because he doesn't know if you call the function twice, will you get the same value or not. So those functions you need to annotate, we call them non-deterministic in this case, and that will probably make the optimize, give the optimizer less opportunities to optimize the query. Just side note, because you, all of you seem to be interested in optimization. <coughs> okay. So let me, do we still have time? Yeah. Okay, then I'm going to do one more query, which is the most complicated one, and I hope it Working. So what I want to do is I want to go through my answers now and for each see which user has the biggest streak in answering questions. So what I would like to ask is give me the number of consecutive days a user posted an answer. So he posted today or yesterday and today. That would be a streak of two. And let's say who has the, the biggest streak. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, again, query the collection answers. And I'm going to group by, in this case, the user ID. I could probably use the name as well, but I haven't tested it. So I'm going to group by the user ID. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a new variable answers. And what I'm going to do in here is I'm going to sort for each user his answers by creation date. So I will do order by a creation date. And in this case, I would like to do this. And then return the answers. So what the answers variable will contain after this is the sequence of answers for a given user in ascending order of the creation date. Okay? And then what I'm like what I would like to do is I would like to compute the streak. And for the streak I'm going to use the concept of the language that is called windowing. So what I will do is I will go through the sorted sequence in Windows, look at it in Windows and see uh, and look at each particular window in, in order to decide when a window starts and when it ends. And in this case, uh, a window will be the consecutive answer queries, the consecutive things. So the construct is called fall tumbling window. I'm going to use our A here in answers. And I'm not interested in a particular start condition for the window. So I'm just saying when, whenever the start condition is true. And I'm going to define a variable end and next. End would be pointing to the end of the window. 
and next would be a pointer while I'm going through the window to the, the next one that I'm looking at and I'm going to specify I need to specify what the, the condition here is and the condition would be when the creation date of the next one minus the creation date <coughs> of the end one is greater than the date time duration atomic value of one day. You still see it? <coughs> so that's the entire condition here. I'm going to elaborate on it. And what I'm going to return for each of those windows is the computation of the streak. So it would be creation date of the end of the window minus the creation date of the start of the window. So that will give me the streak. And it's actually not correct to call it streaks. It would be all the streaks of a user. <clears throat> and then what I, what I would like to know is what's the maximum streak? So I'm just say uh, here the maximum value all of out of out of all the streaks. I will order it descending by max streak to get the user with the highest streak, and then return the username, which in this case would be called the answer display name, because answer in this case is a sequence. I'm just taking the first object out of here and obviously I'm going to give the streak the next streak. Oops, this. So what you can see here is that this guy Niels has a streak of seven dates. Now that's a duration notation according to the W3 uh, the IEEE I think. <clears throat> but if I don't want to get this because it's too enterprisey then there are functions in the language that extract you, in this case, the days from this duration. And so the days is set. Yes, please. Uh, so for the tumbling window thing, uh, is that keeping the entire length of speak and memory, or is it only taking the start and then dropping all the intermediate uh, no, it, elements it, as you're going <coughs> through it? It needs to keep all of the ones in memory. So the maximum memory consumption therefore tumbling window that you have is the, the size of the window. Okay. Because what you see here is that you actually need all the all the values. You, uh, well, it, there you are expressions where you can use all the values. Okay. I mean in that case you don't, right? In this case you just return n minus start. But yeah, there are expressions. Okay. And so the the interesting things about this curry is uh, first of all I think it's very complex it's I don't know around 17 18 lines of code but it's doing some quite complex stuff it's doing grouping sorting some window expression does does aggregation and uh, an interesting feature here is that it actually has support for full date time and duration arithmetics so the creation date in here it's I think it's a mongo Mongo, what they call timestamp, which is a, a date in the UTC time zone. They don't store other time zones. And you can subtract them and have date time duration constructors and operations. So you can do minus and compare to minutes or hours or days or months. And there are also functions that allow you to format date times in arbitrary strings for presentation and arbitrary languages and stuff like that stuff that you're used to probably from Java. Yes? Sorry, just one more question about the tumbling window. Um, so if I have 100 consecutive uh, answers, um, will that go from 0 to 99, and then 1 to 99, and then 2 to 99? Or will that only do one iteration? No, it will only do one iteration. <coughs> okay. um, There's also a sliding window expression, in which case you have uh, overlapping windows. So the tumbling windows are non-overlapping. And the sliding windows, you can have overlapping ones. Mm. I have not seen a useful query that is using uh, overlapping windows, but that's just because I haven't seen it used. So, yeah, that's about it. That's about all the, the queries that I wanted to show you. I can show you more queries if you're interested offline. And you can, 
ask by email questions if you would like to see some queries and have other data set and would like to see some queries, I'm happy to answer all of them if I can. Yes, please. So it seems pretty cool that there's these um, friendly like time functions built into the language. You know, certain languages, query languages, often don't go to the trouble of doing that. I was wondering, are there any other kind of subdomains that you've provided nice little convenience <coughs> functions for? So there's a lot of stuff. There's math which is something that in Mongo is not there everywhere. <clears throat> there is um, arbitrary precision decimals and integers that you can have, the, all the date time stuff. And then we have developed a bunch of modules that we didn't put in the language specification itself because we don't want to scare implementers of the language away because then they would see the specification and it's like huge and do I really have to implement everything? So we kept them as modules, optional modules on the side, one of which is a full text module that allows you to do some cool stuff. There are the web services modules. So yeah, there, there's a data cleaning modules that allow you to do phonetic string similarities, uh, n-grams, all of the stuff that you would like to, to see in a data cleaning environment if you work with strings. So there are all kinds of domains that we cover. There are also other modules. Uh, I recently, for a customer, implemented a zip module. So what this does is, if you make a REST call and get a zip archive back, then you can unzip it on the fly in the language and extract JSON documents out of it. Usually, if you load something into your database, then you have a zip document. So in the language itself, you can unzip it and get the, the strings out of it. Stuff like this. There's also support for handling binaries in base64 and hex binary. We have uh, cryptographic functions that you usually, if you work with web services, you need some form of hash-based message authentication, the MD5 computation, stuff like this. So all these are extensions to the language that we provide in modules. Yes. 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 Um, kind of got a complicated question. Um, do you see that when people use this, that they end up maybe, because you can do join-like constructs easier with JSONic, that people build more normalized um, databases? And kind of the reason I was thinking <coughs> that was, if you look at the answers database, imagine if one of your users was to say, change their gravatar. It's like, just thinking from running a real system, in, in a normalized SQL system, you would just look up that user's record, update your gravatar, and you're done. Yes. But in this system, you would literally have to go through every single question to find out which ones were that, or which, every single answer, to find the ones that match that user, and then update all of their gravatars. It seems like a lot of extra work. So <clears throat> there's no right and wrong answer here. At the end, the design of your data layout, logical or physical, always depends on your use cases. And in Mongo, as well in the relational world, you will have to always spend a significant amount of time to design your data layout. The Tengen guys have published books about this, how they advise you to structure your data. And it depends on so many factors, like if it's read intensive, if you have a lot of updates, if you like want atomic updates to your documents. So, what I can tell you here is that sometimes it doesn't make sense or normalizing or denormalizing like Mongo would advise you is just not possible or doesn't make sense in your setting, in which case this language will help you to still do the queries. It all depends on the queries, but we also have customers, since we have a JDBC connector also, what they do is they have a SQL database and they just want to dump their entire database into Mongo. And obviously, the result will be pretty normalized because we map one table to one collection. So they can already start. So they can still have their queries and they can write their join queries. But I'm not saying it's the data layout that I would advise them to use. So it depends on the use case. It, it just seems to me that without a language like this, if you use Mongo and you have really normalized data, you're forced to kind of re-implement the join construct yourself. But one That's of the nice true. things about this is you guys have done it and then 
over time you can make your yeah. your back end more efficient. Yeah, it's, it's true. It's uh, an advantage and a disadvantage at the same time. First of all, if you don't have the join, it requires you to think about your data layout, which is probably a good idea and which developers otherwise wouldn't. If you have this concept, it's pretty easy to do a join, but later you might be stuck with performance problems because actually you wanted to denormalize it. And um, But at the end, I think, at the moment, the pressure on NoSQL developers is too high because everybody has to implement their own algorithms like joins. And nobody can convince me that this is more productive than if you have a high-level query language that implements joins. And so I believe a high-level query language in the long run with good optimizers and good implementations will take the pressure again away from the developers and put it in the language itself. Uh, so you talk about the three implementations of JSON. There's like a Zorba, 28, Dion, and another one. So Zorba is an open source Apache license query processor implemented in C++. It has been mostly built by the Flower Foundation, which is a non-profit, obviously. And in 28.0, oh, we use Zorba as the query processor internally. Zorba itself doesn't connect to any data store, so you cannot take Zorba and put it on Mongo. That's where the added value of our service is. <coughs> but in the core, it's still Zorba. And you can use each of those programs exactly like they are and put them in Zorba. And if you want, you can run the queries then on your files. Or since Zorba is open source, come up with your own store for Zorba that implements it. Um, there's another implementation from a guy that I don't know who implemented JSONic in Pascal. I assume he just does that because he can. Um, <coughs> it's a full featured JSONic implementation. And uh, yesterday I heard, as I said, that IBM also implemented parts of JSONic. And we are talking to Oracle because Oracle is a, is a sponsor of the Flower Foundation to put the, the language on top of on one of their data stores. <coughs> Zorba itself has a bunch of modules. For example, want to talk to Couchbase and so what you can do is you can take the exact same program and run it on your Couchbase database. Obviously less efficient because there's no deep integration with the Couchbase store, but you can run the same query on top of Couchbase as well. Uh, you touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, so can you uh, kind of clarify for me, like, is the, the ability to define functions, is that part of the design specification? Yes. Okay. <coughs> yes, it is. And then, are there the specification also find like a certain like kind of pre-built and kind of required function that you can have? So the specification has a uh, built-in functions as it specifies, and those are considered mandatory. It's all of the math functions, but none of the daytime duration functions. So mostly, it's the math stuff that is mandatory. And there five, six other functions. One is called parse JSON that takes a string and returns an object. The other function is called serialize that takes an object and spits it out in a string. And there are other functions that you need for completeness that allow you to do, um, one is distinct values, the other one is descendant objects. You have a, an intersection function of two objects and you have a union of objects which are functions that are also in the language. So it's in theory, like, if um, we were to write, like, a JSON on top of a, a SQL database or something like that, um, like, because all the all the functions are kind of defined as part of the specification, like, it would just work, kind of, right? Yes, right. absolutely. <coughs> I mean, with mathematical and daytime function, the devil is always in the detail. Like, what's your value space for the decimals? And what's your value space for the doubles? And <coughs> so, and no two SQL databases have the same value space for their numerics. So at the end, it's always about details. 
you could use all of the simple functions. <coughs> I can show you, if you want to see it, how you can use a module. So what I could do here is I could just say import module namespace, call it full text, and then we have a module that is called full text. And let's say, and I'm just making this pretty up now, if I want to go through the FAQ collection and for the FAQ collection and I guess the titles of all the questions. And let's say I want to use the full text module. So for each title, I would like to get the tokens of the, so I would like to tokenize the string. So I could use the full text module tokenize the title. And then I could say for each token in tokens, let convert the token into lowercase where the lowercase token is uh, not a stop word so we throw away not so useful stuff then I group by the lowercase token I count the number of tokens just making this up, I'm not expecting it to work. <coughs> and then I'm going to return the token. And the count. So, in this case, what I have is I can see that the token NoSQL with various uh, spellings appears 60 times in all the things, and I can use this query to, to build up a attack lot, for example. So I can say that the token MongoDB appears 29 times, database 22, so I can build a kind of attack lot and see how many tokens are in the titles, in the, all the titles in the database. So that's using a module here. So I need to import it explicitly, bind it to some prefix. And then I can use the functions of this module. And again, it's I think it's pretty powerful stuff that you're doing here. You're doing some pretty sophisticated full text stuff in a couple of lines of code. And I was able to type it without looking at it. Does that answer your, your question? Yes. Your feeling about the functions? So the, t the full text functions are implemented in C++. But, and if you want to provide functions on this platform, we only allow you to implement them in the in JSONIC itself, obviously. Only if you convince us that your implementation and you want is your C++ implementation is, is good, we would probably roll it out on our platform. <coughs> we also have uh, Java bindings, so you can use uh, develop modules in Java or other languages. And so your functions are pre uh, you compile your functions and functions? Define functions? Um, you mean if you do, do your own function? Yes. So at the moment, how it would work is we would pre-compile your main query. And whatever functions this main query would use, we would pre-compile this in the same main query. So if you have multiple main queries that use the same function, we would compile it, have it physically multiple times because we don't do what we call independent compilation of modules, but we can add this if we believe that this is necessary, that you can compile a module like a, a Java class file or just give it to somebody in a binary file. <coughs> At the moment, that's not. But it's up to the implementation, so if you want to do one, Logically, the semantics of the function declaration should allow you to do independent compilation because you need, don't need to know about any transitive dependencies or anything. 
Okay, no more questions. Thank yeah. you.